Hello, good evening, everybody. It's so nice to be able to breathe and to meet you all here in such large numbers. Uh, that's a first for this series here for a very long time to have so many people here on site. So thank you for coming. Uh, welcome here at Sprechspeicher in Berlin. Welcome to our viewers streaming this event live on a device near you. On Alex TV, on the respective websites of the partnering institutions of the lecture series Making Sense of the Digital Society that has been running for five years, actually. Um, it is a joint venture between the Federal Agency for Civic Education, Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung in German, and of course the HIC, the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. But tonight is a very special night in more than one sense, because the following lecture, the ensuing conversation with the help of you here on site, the audience and at home through a participatory tool called Slido, is called, is the kickoff of a three-day conference of call, of course, as you can see, called Artificial Intelligence and the Human Cross-Cultural Perspectives on Science and Fiction. So on behalf of our series Making Sense, I as the mere moderator of these events would like to really warmly thank the Japanese German Center Berlin for co-hosting this very prom uh, promising conference on cultural specificities of AI and how they vary in different parts of the world and why it has taken so long to acknowledge these differences. That's a point we're going to touch on uh, pretty soon in the talk we're going to hear tonight. Above all, let me thank Julia Münch, the Secretary General of the Japanese German Center Berlin, beautifully located, if you don't know it, in Berlin Zehlendorf, by the way, not far from the main buildings of the FU, the Freie Universität, here at Berlin. So thank you. Many thanks, of course, also to the main curating force behind this program, Thomas Christian Pechle, uh, from the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society here in Berlin. Central for the beginning of this project, and furthermore, as one of the visitors, one of the quite a few visitors actually, from Japan, of course, thank you, Watanabe Katsumi from Waseda University in Tokyo. Please, a big hand for all those people involved making this event possible. Thank you. So I'm very excited to start this conference by introducing shortly to you tonight's speaker and her topic, so central to the scope of the coming days of, those, of that conference. How the world sees intelligent machines. The world, stress the world. Very eager to learn here more myself since it is a topic opening up massively in times while its cracks had largely gone unnoticed for so many years, decades, maybe even centuries in the West at least. So let me just give you, um, as an anecdote maybe, just one more example that ties in with our event of tonight here. So let me ask, are there any dancers in the room here? Are there any people that uh, could not go to clubs or to raves or to anything like that in the last two years? I'm sure there are, yeah. I see a couple of hands uh, rising here. So um, what would you say this music actually originated? Quote, unquote. What would you say? Not in Germany, although Germany did play a role. You know, bands like Kraftwerk, Neu, Can, they were called the so-called Kraut Talk, which is very repetitive and electronic, uh, originated in Western Germany. But central, no doubt, to the originating music are, of course, African-American inner cities, um, Detroit, Chicago, New York, even. There's many books about the histories of house music, techno music, and so forth, but it took decades until the West discovered a record from India dating back as far as 1982. Check it out. You can see it on YouTube, actually. The record is called Ten Ragas to a Disco Beat by a musician nobody knew in the West. His name is Jaranjit Singh. This record sounded an awful lot like Acid House from Chicago, even though the melodic material and some of the micro rhythms were specific uh, to ragas, to a, a very ancient Indian tradition, of course. But one answer to this stunning likeness of this music nobody knew about in the 80s, in the 90s, even in the noughties, one answer to that is they all used the same machines in Chicago, in Detroit, in New York, and in Mumbai. Machines made in Japan, by the way. Bass and drum computers called 303 and 808, and a synthesizer called the Jupiter 8, all made by a Japanese company called Roland. 
I'm quite sure or hope that today it would not take decades for the West to see these diverse roots that grew in different parts of the world, sometimes simultaneously. But of course, these machines could hardly be called what we call artificial intelligence nowadays. Some of them worked with transistors that were deliberately broken, actually, to get a very specific distorted sound. Um, so that's a little of a different thing. But maybe it's a small ramp to lead you up to the research of Kanta Di Hall and her keynote, How, to, How the World Sees Intelligent Machines. She's a senior research fellow at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence at the University of Cambridge and leads two research projects there. One is called Global AI Narratives, the other Decolonizing AI, in which she explores intercultural public understanding of artificial intelligence as constructed by fictional and non-fictional narratives. So we're going to hear a lot about books and films also um, this evening, since our speaker has also a background in the humanities. Born in the Netherlands, she started her academic education with degrees in film and literature before she got her PhD at Oxford in science communication. Her thesis explored the communication of conflicting interpretations of quantum physics to adults and children. She's also the co-editor of the book's AI Narratives, a history of imaginative thinking about intelligent machines at Oxford University Press two years ago, and the new one, Imagining AI, How the World Sees Intelligent Machines, the title of tonight's talk, due to come out later this year. She has also co-authored a series of papers on AI narratives with Stephen Cave, including the whiteness of AI, a concept you will um, encounter in her talk in a matter of seconds now. And after the lecture, we are going to start the conversation here on stage, just the two of us for maybe 10, 15 minutes before taking your questions from the floor at home uh, with Slido, the participatory tool, if you're watching the stream. But now the floor is entirely hers. Please welcome Kanta Diha. Thank you very much, Toby. Thank you so much, everyone, for having me. Thank you for granting me the honor of opening the conference with this lecture tonight. And, and my particular thanks go to Thomas Bechler for inviting me and uh, to Lena Henkers for making sure that I got here on time with all my things and who arranged the whole trip. I mean, for many of us, this has been quite a while that we've been able to do all this. Um, so I would like to start off tonight with a question for you to consider. Um, how do you describe AI to a friend? Think about how you would explain what exactly AI is. What would your explanation look like? Would it be something like artificial intelligence seeks to make computers do the sorts of things that minds can do? Or is it more likely to be in the not too distant future, all daily tasks will be carried out by machines, leaving us to become even more lazy and idle than we uh, already are, and the Terminator movies will become real. Or will it be something like scary robots? So the first of these is a definition by an expert, Professor Margaret Bowden, who essentially invented the field of cognitive science. The second and third and all the others on the slide right now were definitions given by members of the British public when my colleague Stephen Cave and I conducted a national survey of attitudes towards AI. And these kinds of results indicate several of the reasons why I did the research that I'll be talking about today. First of all, a gap between expert and general understanding of AI. Second, the role of stories, particularly science fiction, in shaping those perceptions. And third, and most importantly, these views are taken from members of the UK public. And as I'll be showing you today, these views, perhaps for the best, are not universally shared across the globe. Before I go any further, I should point out that all of the research that led to the information that I'm giving you today was conducted together with my co-author, Stephen Cave, who is currently in Cambridge, but who does deserve equal credit. So in tonight's lecture, I will introduce views and visions of AI from around the world. 
First, I'll be starting close to Berlin and its history uh, with uh, visions of AI in communist states, particularly in the 20th century. Then, of course, in keeping with the conference's Japanese-German theme, I will be addressing real and apparent differences between Eastern and Western portrayals of AI. And finally, I'll be giving examples from around the world of narratives of AI that explicitly aim to reject colonialist views of the technology. But first, for some context, who am I to be doing this? And why am I doing it? So I'm a senior research fellow, as uh, uh, Toby Muller just uh, mentioned, at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence, or CFI for short, um, which is based at the University of Cambridge, but it's a collaboration between four universities, Cambridge, Oxford, Imperial College London, and Berkeley in California. Now, I have a literature background uh, specializing in, in uh, science narratives, as Toby mentioned, that includes science communication, as you might find in popular magazines or um, on, on TV, um, as well as science fiction. Any kind of story, fictional or non-fictional or somewhere in between, about science. And that's how I ended up working at an artificial intelligence research center with a literary studies background. Uh, so CFI is an interdisciplinary research center uh, founded in 2016, and it's focused on the nature, ethics, and impact of AI. We've currently got 20 research projects uh, that range from responsible innovation to exploring the relationship between machine and biological intelligence, and we've got the world's first master's degree in AI ethics. And our researchers come from a huge range of disciplines, um, in, in, including also machine learning, law, philosophy, etc. And I work within a program called AI Narratives and Justice, which looks at questions of artificial intelligence and social justice. So the two research projects uh, that inform my talk today, Global AI Narratives and Decolonizing AI, um, originally developed from a project started in 2017 called AI Narratives. And in that original project, we investigated the portrayals and perceptions of AI in the English-speaking world. So that resulted in that 2020 book, AI Narratives, um, which uh, shown behind me. And since we also had interest from people developing the technology, from industry, policy, such as the United Nations, so people who aren't academics and who don't want to go through a 300-page book, we also wrote a non-academic report. And the sequel to the book um, will be out at the end of this year under the title Imagining AI, How the World Sees Intelligent Machines. Hopefully end of this year. It's a contributions to that book, contributions from all over the world, um, which inform the examples that I'll be giving in this lecture. So in the initial AI narratives project, we examined the dominant narratives about artificial intelligence in the English-speaking West and how they stereotype the technology, but also those who build the technology and those who are affected by it. And that tradition was our starting place because it is disproportionately uh, influential. How influential exactly? Well. One key point to bear in mind is that artificial intelligence was a cultural phenomenon long before it was a technological one. In some cultures, visions of intelligent machines go back centuries, even millennia, like in ancient Greece and ancient China. And such visions keep popping up throughout history, ideas of building intelligent machines out of metal, out of wood, uh, creating life from non-living material. And those visions spread with industrialization, especially, until by the 20th century, a future where those kinds of machines were being really richly imagined around the world. So when the term artificial intelligence was coined in the US in 1956, it was not to name a new invention but it was to express a determination to realize an ancient fantasy. And some would say that AI is still a cultural phenomenon and not a technological one. Some would say that for all the innovations in computing, all the hype in industry and policy, 
No existing systems deserve to be called truly intelligent. But others argue that we are surrounded by AI. It pervades our daily lives through our smartphones, the online services we use, and the hidden systems that govern us. Now, it's hard to think of another technology in history about which such a debate could be had. A debate about whether it's everywhere or nowhere at all. That it can be held about AI is a testament to its mythic quality, the amount of storytelling that is part of this technology. Now, of course, innovation in real digital technology is actually happening. It's really rapid. And it's constantly interacting with that ancient set of stories of intelligent machines. So this cultural background shapes what motivates funders and engineers, how products are designed, whether and by whom technologies are taken up, how they are regulated, and so on. Academia, industry, media, policy, they're all interwoven and they're mutually influential. So let's give an example from the Western canon to show really how the dominant stories and the dominant technologies uh, are connected. And that is the 2014 film Transcendence, a Hollywood film uh, which tells the story of an AI expert, Will Castor, played by Johnny Depp, who has his mind uploaded into an AI system. Now, during this film, so this film was not a success. It completely bombed, okay, which is why well, you probably haven't heard of it. But during the film's opening weekend, three very well-known scientists who you may have heard of, unlike this film, Stephen Hawking, Max Tegmark, and Stuart Russell, published a Huffington Post article uh, titled Transcending Complacency on Superintelligent Machines. And in that article, they argue that, and I quote from the article, as the Hollywood blockbuster Transcendence de debuts uh, this weekend with Johnny Depp, Morgan Freeman, and clashing visions for the future of humanity, it's tempting to dismiss the notion of highly intelligent machines as mere science fiction. But this would be a mistake, and potentially our worst mistake ever. So in this article, these three really influential scientists um, use this film to convince policymakers and other groups of the importance of AI. And that same month, one of those authors, Max Tegmark, founded the Future of Life Research Institute, which aims to ensure that tomorrow's most powerful technologies are beneficial for humanity. That institute is partly funded by Elon Musk, who is a real-life technology magnate and pioneer of AI-driven cars. Musk also appears in a cameo in Transcendence as an audience member of the lecture that Will Castor, the fictional AI engineer, gives um, about AI. In addition, Morgan Freeman, who plays an AI engineer in this film, sits on the board of the real Future of Life Research in uh, uh, Institute, alongside Elon Musk. So the film, therefore, perfectly reflects what I call the Californian feedback loop. <laughs> this entanglement of Hollywood, of academic research, of industrial production, of narrative, and the fight to shape the future. So stories like Transcendence literally co-construct what AI is understood to be. It embeds or disputes existing attitudes and approaches. It creates, it directs funding streams. And all of that comes out of one very small part of the United States. But crucially, those attitudes, those approaches are not the same around the world. They are shaped by the particular histories, philosophies, ideologies, religions, narrative traditions, and economic structures of different countries and cultures and peoples. Transcendence is a product of the US, and it's full of well-worn Hollywood tropes, um, which are, to some extent, more or less problematic. There is AI as the ultimate technology and the ultimate solution to all problems. The mind-uploaded Johnny Depp solves pollution, the energy crisis, disease. Um, but at the same time, AI as the ultimate threat to humanity, because mind-uploaded Johnny Depp does go rogue. 
The reduction of an individual to data and computation, mind uploading, and so the possibility of digital immortality, and the lone male genius scientist and a subordinate female um, who must in some way sacrifice herself, as she literally does, in order to make sure that um, the AI is, is stopped in time before it takes over the world. Now, individually, all of these ideas are not unique to Hollywood. Each can be found elsewhere, but collectively, they form a really distinctive mythology of AI in America. And there are some serious problems with the fact that this group of narratives keeps reinforcing each other because it's quite a small set of ideas. Um, I mean, what you see in nearly every story about AI to come up from this area is, for example, um, the extent to which portrayals of intelligent machines are anthropomorphized, are made to look like humans. And correspondingly, they are gendered, they are racialized. Um, an AI is made that looks like Johnny Depp. And the um, mythological and imaginative tradition that leads to current conceptions of AI is quite different to the way other technologies are being portrayed. Other technologies are not personified in that extent. Intelligent machines are never portrayed as just tools. They have always been agents. Making them look like humans implies that they can do all these things that humans do, but also that they take on human roles in society, that they follow human social patterns. Um, so, for example, we imagine AI servants, AI soldiers, AI cleaners, um, and, and not just those um, human jobs, but also social roles, relationships, friend, lover, child, parent, um, which means that you have to position the AI in very complex social hierarchies. And so while these machines are taking on human roles, are, are shown in fiction that shows them taking on human roles, they are exaggerated in some dimensions and flattened in others. As soldiers, they're hyper-masculine. As lovers, they're hyper-feminine. They're supposed to show initiative and intelligence in their roles, but at the same time, People hope that these robots are unthinkingly loyal slaves, and if they are not, then it is a problem and they are depicted as a threat to humanity. Um, now, of course, the concept of robot slaves is a highly racialized one, but here comes another problem of the stories to come out of the Californian feedback loop. Intelligent robots are only very, very uh, rarely coded as racially um, any kind of person of color. Um, and on the contrary, they are overwhelmingly depicted as white, both in ethnicity and just in color, as you can see here. So that is what we examined in the paper, The Whiteness of AI, that uh, Toby mentioned. So in that paper, we examined the way in which AI in the West is used to create a kind of white utopia from which people of color are entirely absent and the consequences that has for public perceptions and the implementation of contemporary AI technologies. So there is a stereotype of the kind of products that are created, the intelligent machines themselves, but these kinds of narratives also um, perpetuate and exacerbate stereotypes and expectations about the creators of these project, uh, products, the AI scientist or developer. So, as you can see here, some examples, in addition to Johnny Depp earlier. Um, the dominant AI narratives in the Anglophone West tend to be literally the product of the white male imagination, in that the great majority of those who have created these dominant imaginaries of AI are educated white men. But at the same time, in those stories, white men create white robots. So even in our imagination, AI is the product of the white male imagination. Um, we might call the con cultural construction of the AI engineer the white male genius trope. 
um, which is a, a, a strong one um, in, in all of these uh, films uh, from which I'm showing stills behind me. Um, and that, we think, is a very strong factor in contributing to, in real life, the low number of women able to enter the field of AI and the hostility they face when they are there for not fitting in culturally. Now, we're currently actually near the end of a project analyzing a very large corpus, over 1,000 films and 10,000 episodes of TV shows, looking at how AI scientists and engineers are gendered and racialized in Anglophone film and television. So those are some of the themes from the Hollywood hegemony and some of the reasons why we might want some alternatives. So is it inevitable that we imagine intelligent machines th uh, this way? We didn't think so. And we wanted to find out exactly what alternatives there are for four reasons. Now, first, AI is now a global phenomenon. While the term, as I said, originated in the US and much of the technology continues to be developed there, these technologies are now being taken up around the world and other countries are scrambling to develop their own AI industries. Now, each will do so informed by their own mythologies of AI, their own um, sets of stories and ideologies that shape their expectations and anxieties around what that technology can be. And so understanding how AI will develop and how it might differ in different parts of the world requires an understanding of those many places, those many sites in which uh, its story is unfolding. But also, the debate around how AI is developed responsibly, how it's governed, has been dominated by Anglophone actors. And um, it is starting to change. More countries are developing their own AI strategies but they are entering a space that is already shaped by assumptions from the English-speaking West. So there is a risk that efforts to regulate real-world AI will fail as they are insensitive to different cultural contexts, or as that they will impose solutions that unknowingly or inadvertently prejudice some traditions. So it's extremely important to develop a better understanding of this diversity of views of what AI should or could be. And of course, we hope that that comparative approach will shed new light for people, whether here or elsewhere. I mean, um, seeing where other cultures share or differ in their approaches to AI gives insight into the forces that shape those traditions. So for example, when you've got a range of narratives from capitalist countries, you could see what do they have in common, or what do countries that have histories of colonialism have in common, and how does that shape their stories about AI? Or on the other side, countries that have been colonized. Um, so, for example, um, I've been looking at um, uh, anti-colonial or decolonial AI narratives from Latin America, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Hawaii, um, which all show that while resistance takes many shapes, shared themes resonate across continents. Um, so from the platforming of non-Western knowledge and forms of knowing with respect to AI to critically reflect on what is considered advanced versus backward to reappropriating technologies from the West for purposes, for, for new purposes, new art forms, um, and for using these kinds of stories specifically for post-colonial nation building. But we see also narratives about catching up to other countries from South Korea, India, and Russia. Um, and narratives have historically resisted and supported a really broad range of ideologies from communism in mid 20th century China and the Soviet Union and Italy to neoliberalism in Chile to technocracy in Singapore, and I'll be touching on some of those uh, further later on. 
But also, each cultural perspective is limited and particular, and it privileges some within that culture and prejudices us. So while the English-speaking West is um, inflected by ideologies of racial and gender and class hierarchy, um, people have been uh, calling for new imaginaries of technology because each culture has these kinds of blind spots. And so only by crossing over and comparing notes um, each culture can see what their own lacks are, and what their own um, blind spots are, the bits that they are missing from their narratives. Now, of course, the limitations that I've just pointed out are not solved simply by, you know, adding some Chinese works to your reading list or consulting an indigenous person or mentioning Ubuntu ethics at a workshop on AI regulation. But what's been happening so far is that these kinds of narratives have not been given the light of day at all. And that just means that um, the kind of thinking uh, around these issues has been a lot shallower than it could have been, simply because it, uh, the same stories that you have already heard are repeated again and again. So it was with all that in mind that we started the Global AI Narratives Research Project in 2018. It was in collaboration with uh, nine partner institutions on six continents, and we aimed to, well, understand and analyze how different cultures and regions perceive the benefits and uh, risks of artificial intelligence. And we did so through convening a series of 20 workshops across the globe between 2018 and 2021. Uh, which we moved online at the start of the pandemic. And through that, we built an international network of experts on portrayals and perceptions of AI beyond the English-speaking West, um, with relating that to pressing questions of real AI ethics and governance right now. So all that was our motivations for doing this work. And now we'll move to sharing some of the results. And as I mentioned, I'll start relatively close to home for my Berlin audience. So we held workshops in Russia, China, and the Czech Republic. And so we really frequently encountered these narratives of AI in a communist context. Now, scholar and science fiction author Anton Bevushin has pointed out that um, Soviet narratives about artificial intelligence presented mainly ideas of very trustworthy AIs in the service of humanity, um, such as in uh, Ivan Efremov's Andromeda Nebula from 1957, which explored a communist utopia in which an AI acts as the logical overseer and decision maker, although there are still humans overseeing the overseer. And those kinds of narratives in Russia really, the, the ones about the subservient or assistive AI, influence people's perce uh, perceptions of what real AI could be like. So um, until the 2010s, the ways people expressed what they wanted from AI was a terminator in the service of mankind, which m basically means that they demanded of chatbots that they must know everything, not have any emotions, perform commands, answer questions, not the bit where it travels through time to kill people. But recently, this terminator in the service of mankind view has changed. People nowadays don't want those stereotypical movie AIs anymore, but likable human-like chatbots that don't know everything and that can make small talk. And central to those kinds of ideas is the concept of, um, as Anton Pavushin calls it, the Russian soul, which underlies the notion of a Russian national and cultural identity. Questions of what it means to be human, whether an intelligent machine could be considered human by virtue of it exhibiting traits that evidence having some kind of soul um, were really closely related to questions of what it meant to be a Soviet citizen. So in one Soviet film, uh, I'm not making this up, the most important test for the AI to prove that it was human was whether it could drink vodka. 
But also, in a very popular TV series uh, from the 1980s called The Adventures of Electronic, which was based on a children's book, there's a robot electronic that looks like a boy and aspires to be human. So Electronic decides to go to school with other children and learns how to laugh and how to cry. And so rather than having a whole range of evil robots, um, like in the Western tradition, this very popular little robot is one that is funny. But the most influential AI narrative to come out of Eastern Europe is, of course, Karel Čapek's RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots, a play from 1921. And that's a story of artificial workers rising up against humanity and exterminating them. And it's a very clear metaphor of the oppressed underclass violently rising up against the bourgeoisie. That play was a huge hit across the world, not only in Europe, where, which recently had had such violent revolts all the time, but also from the US to Japan. And in the USSR, it was adapted by the famous writer Alexei Nikolaevich Tolstoy as the revolt of the machines. So a version that is even more explicitly aligned with communist ideology. And in the mid-20th century, um, cybernetics, the first kind of science that um, investigated, um, well, that was served as a predecessor to what's now called artificial intelligence, um, became very interestingly entangled with Soviet ideology. It was first developed in 1948 by an American scientist, Norbert Wiener, and initially his work was banned in the USSR. His ideas were considered a threat to Marxist-Leninist philosophy of science. But in the post-Stalin era, cybernetics had a complete revival in the USSR. It was seen as a way to break away from the hard labor that defined the Stalinist era. So to create an opportunity for a really egalitarian and post-work world, so um, luxury, uh, um, luxury space communism. And I should, should mention the role that US science fiction in translation played here. Um, for example, Isaac Asimov, who is one of the great shapers of the American AI canon, while he moved from the Soviet Union to the US at age two, he really took pains to depict himself as completely American. And back in the Soviet Union, he was perceived as American when his works were translated into Russian a couple of decades after they first came out. And actually, as um, my colleagues Angelika Solovieva and Nick Hinek have pointed out, Asimov's work resonated really strongly with those Soviet imaginations of intelligent machines that try to be human and try to be nice and funny. So they write, Hollywood often featured terrifying killer robots such as in The Terminator, whereas Soviet people usually imagined robots as almost indistinguishable from humans in both appearance and behavior, as we saw when we looked at the boy electronic. So paradoxically, they say, it was Soviet rather than American robots which were designed to naturally observe Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics, the uh, laws that he became so famous with in all his robot stories uh, from the 1930s to the 1990s. So next, I shall look at China as a bridge between my first topic, AI in a communist context, and my next, the differences between East and West. Now, China has several ancient philosophies, Confucianism, Moism, and Taoism, that have, for thousands of years, expressed views on technological advance and whether developing intelligent machines is a good thing, whether developing specific kinds of machines is a good thing. Nonetheless, as uh, the scholars Chang Bai Chun and Tian Miao have argued, real technological development often flew in the face of sage advice. So for example, while um, Taoists 
warned against the development of advanced technology for warfaring purposes. Um, weaponry developed really rapidly from um, the spring and autumn period, which is around the, uh, the year 770 BC, all the way through to the Han Dynasty, which ended in the year 220. So uh, in spite of philosophers writing, you should not de develop technology for this, and having really advanced, essentially, technology ethics, um, uh, in, in fact, the technology developed at that time far beyond what anyone else in the world was capable of. But moving forward to the modern era, it, so in China, Following the Chinese Civil War from 1945 to 1949, science fiction literature served really a political role. Um, our colleague Wu Yan explains that in the science fiction of the early People's Republic, so this was under Chairman Mao, um, writers were consistently concerned about the issue of AI technology replacing human labor. Humans being replaced by machines, nothing new and nothing uh, solely reserved for Western imaginaries. So opposition to the replacement of all kinds of labor by intelligent machines was the dominant idea in science fiction during this period. Most stories argued that AI would create lazy people, reduce human motivation to learn, and set society back. But after Mao's death, Chinese science fiction actually became more heavily influenced by the Soviet stories that I've just been looking at. It wasn't a straightforward influence because Soviet works were, during the Mao era, uh, often criticized or banned for not properly aligning with Marxist values as they were interpreted under Mao. And like in the Soviet examples, um, science fiction in China now began to feature stories about artificially intelligent machines built to solve problems and being helpful and obedient servants to their creators. So come, going from the more fearful and worried AI going to take our jobs stories to the more positive and, and hopeful stories about living with AI. Um, continuing the theme of looking at Eastern AI narratives. Um, let's look at Singapore, uh, where governance and technology in the late 20th and the 21st century are really closely intertwined. And Singapore is really unique in that technology is an integral part of the dominant and official utopian visions for the island. And there's a long tradition of imagining the island state of Singapore as a potential utopia. That's a tradition that began with um, the British and continued by Chinese invaders and settlers. But Sing Lit, as Singaporean literature is known, tends to be dystopian with a very specific function, to provide an alternative to the narratives promoted by the government so those who don't agree with the kind of utopia that the government wants write these kind of narratives. Now, to Japan. Japan is, of course, and I must, of course, um, uh, say that, uh, that I am not the expert on Japan in the room here today or this week. Um, but Japan is perhaps most famous for being different from the West in imagining a future with AI. There are many ways in which this is absolutely true. Um, there seems to me less concern about AI taking our jobs than there is in most Western countries, um, as my Japanese colleagues have pointed out, partly due to a very rapidly aging society in which there are simply aren't enough people of working age in Japan to do all the work that needs to be done. But this is also one explanation why Japan is less concerned with themes of robot rebellion. And um, just like in the um, examples from uh, China and Russia, um, there is a tendency to portray intelligent machines as friends, as helpers, as extensions of humans instead of, you know, murderous and rebellious others. But the most widely known difference between Japanese and Western ways of imagining AI is based on a difference in philosophical traditions, of which the Japanese tradition of animism emphasizes connectedness between different kinds of entities, such as human, animal, and machine. 
But now what I found really interesting to learn is my colleagues Daniel White and Hirofumi Katsuno have argued that the role of animism in this perception of AI is a lot more political than you might at first think. They claim that animism was reinvented as a cultural model to define the relationship between people and robots in Japan during the Japanese robot boom of the late 20th century for a specific reason. While the theme of human-robot partnership did come to dominate the technological imaginary in Japan, it often did so in conjunction with practices of representing technology in Japan's modernity as a symbol of cultural distinctiveness in opposition to the West. So in other words, Japanese philosophy was being deliberately foregrounded as a way to emphasize how unique and different from the West Japan and its technology was. It was animism as a unique selling point, to put it much more bluntly than my colleagues have done. In South Korea, it has many of these aspects in common with Japan, but I also found there are some notable differences. For example, there is some concern about automation-related job loss, even though the population is aging almost as rapidly as it is in Japan. But the most important difference is due to what has been called AlphaGo shock. So as many of you may have heard, in 2016, the British AI company DeepMind set its Go-playing program AlphaGo against the South Korean grandmaster and world champion Lee Sedol, and the computer won. That was a milestone for AI development because it showed the success of a new way of training AI. But it was a huge shock in South Korea for two reasons. First, of course, the shock to tradition and culture that comes with the South Korean world champion. Um, it's such a nationally important game being beaten by a computer. But second, the realization that this computer was not made in South Korea or even anywhere in Asia, but in the UK. So that has led to a catch-up narrative, the, a, a story that other countries are ahead and South Korea must catch up in the development of AI technology. And to that purpose, since 2016, this narrative has led to vast sums of money being invested in developing the AI ecosystem in South Korea. So the third and final theme I'll be touching upon tonight is the idea of decolonizing AI. Particularly through the lens of narratives of AI that explicitly aim to reject colonialist views of the technology, which is a theme that frequently emerges on the one hand in narratives about AI in the global south, and on the other hand among marginalized populations in the global north. I'll show three kinds of responses to neo-colonial dominance in the field of AI. Absence, resistance, and reimagining. First, absence. Our work in the Middle East and North Africa, about which we co-authored the report pictured here, um, showed that well, many local um, thinkers and uh, scholars claimed that Egypt, in particular, was a so-called AI desert that there was no development of AI technology ongoing in Egypt, very little in North Africa, nor were there any notable films or literature or non-fiction works stemming for, from the region that portray a future with intelligent machines in any way that could compete with the idea that everything is being imposed either from the West or from Japan, both technology and stories. But that's not the only way of looking at this region. They call it the AI desert, but a desert is not empty and lifeless. Particularly on the Arabian Peninsula, nations are developing their own hybrid of Western technologies and stories with local approaches. So one example is the Ibn Sina robot pictured here, which speaks Arabic. But not everyone is equally happy with that hybrid. Some call this move self-orientalism, using Western technologies with aspects that the West would consider typically Middle Eastern, such as a robot wearing a tobe and a kufia, or science fiction stories featuring jinns. 
So that is absence. But so AI narratives have also been used as an explicit form of resistance. And my next example focuses on AI as a form of anti-racist resistance in Brazil. Um, the scholar Ed Edward King has pointed out that social media in Brazil is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, as we're familiar with around the world, its algorithms drive up and encourage the clustering of like-minded people, including racists and spreaders of hate speech. On the other hand, it has become a platform for resistance. And in Brazil, people resist and provide counter-narratives using the aesthetics of Afrofuturism, which is a movement that focuses on the experiences and concerns of people in the African diaspora through technology, culture, and science fiction. And a wide range of black Brazilian artists use technologies to create new ways of imagining a future in which they are in charge of rather than victims of technology. So here's one example on the slide, um, still from a 2020 video by the artist Vittoria Krib. And finally, I will address ways of reimagining AI, of thinking about what AI might look like in the future if we don't follow the dominant narratives and predictions. So three years ago, a group of indigenous scholars, artists, and thinkers from indigenous communities all over the world started a conversation on how to center and engage their voices in the future development of AI. And one of their approaches, in the words of the scholar Jason Edward Lewis, was to imagine AI as a helper, finding the middle ground between the Hollywood stories of he said, uh, as he said, Blade Runner, which is AI as a slave, and Terminator, which is AI as a tyrant. And instead, uh, imagining a middle ground in which AI and humans are in reciprocal relationships of care and support. Now, he, he and um, his uh, co-authors wrote an amazing position paper in which they offer a series of vignettes that show what that might look like which is from a multi-sensory computing device based on the traditional bags of the Algonquin people in what is now Eastern Canada, to a poem about a child raised by three AIs that are developed from Hawaiian and Blackfoot values, which is illustrated here on the slide. So our one most important takeaway from five years of researching AI and fiction is that the extreme and homogeneous narratives that are dominating the Western discourse are not the only way to imagine a future with intelligent machines. They have been dreamt of across the world in very different ways indeed. Thank you for listening tonight. Thank you so much, Kanta, for this very global outlook indeed, and the histories of how we perceive uh, AI in so many different regions and how to counter that um, whiteness of AI. You were talking about if one of the probably strongest narratives in film, when we talk about AI in the West, mm -hmm. at least is by a British film director, Stanley Kubrick, 19. 68, 2001, A Space Odyssey, it was called. Um, for those of you who uh, haven't seen that film, it um, was dominated actually on the voyage to Jupiter on a spaceship by uh, an AI, which was truly an AI, uh, which was, you know, um, like a singular uh, singularity almost, called HAL, which of course was a wordplay with IBM, then the dominant um, company when it came to computers. HAL just preceding, you know, H preceding I, A preceding B, L preceding M in the alphabet, so H-A-L, IBM, that was the thing um, there. And HAL, was um, superhuman, but if you you know if you see that dialectically, it was very human, so to speak. It was uh, 
how you call it, anthropomorphic almost. It didn't have a body, really, but how it felt, how it spoke. It was very much structured uh, like a language, so to speak. So would you say that anthropomorphization, which is something that is widely discussed in, in AI, is actually a Western concept, or is, something, is it something that you see at various places, like in the Soviet uh, literature that you showed us? It was anthropomorphized very much, even more so than in the West, although it had different traits. But is this like something you would call to be universal when we talk about AI? Um, I'd say anthropomorphism is quite universal, yeah. We have seen it all over the world. And even when you look back at these really ancient ideas of imagining um, intelligent machines, it is actually, it starts with anthropomorphism. That's really how people imagine going to a whole new level of creation of technological development. So say you have um, uh, a t uh, someone who is really good at building new technologies. How do you write a story in which you prove that this person is absolutely extraordinary? Um, how, how do you prove that this is the best craftsman, technologist, developer of a generation, almost godlike? Well, you make it, it's usually a he, imitate life. And so uh, there are stories about mechanical animals, um, so artificial animals. But of course, um, humans like to think of themselves better than any other animal. So again, the next level is making an artificial human. And so stories of artificial humans, of humans made of gold and bronze and wood and metal, are um, some of the oldest ones that we have about AI. So it's, it's definitely, I guess, biomorphization, so making it look like any kind of life form. And within that anthropomorphization, that is the most important idea behind the old stories that now influence real AI, even though we know that it's not going to look like a human anytime soon. We had a guest in, in, in the series Making Sense of the Digital Society, I think at the beginning of the, pen, of the pandemic, Joanna Bryson, and uh, she talked length about saying that uh, anthrop anthropomorphism is actually one of the biggest traps when we uh, think about uh, AI, and it's um, very hard to communicate this with the broader public, that this is not what current AI discourse actually is about, not on the technological side, which you referred to at the beginning uh, of your talk, there's no true AI, um, mm -hmm. it's machines. Uh, that are being built, actually, and not singularities, of course. Yeah. Um, so yeah. how to counter that in a pop cultural sort of way? Because there's many traps, some of them you hinted at. One of them is, of course, racism, that um, mm -hmm. when we anthropomorphize uh, AI in the West, that we end up with uh, a lot of whiteness uh, on robots, even, and, uh, and just how we picture AI. How to counter this? Yes, I completely agree with, with Joanna on this, that um, imagining artificial intelligence as looking like a human, acting like a human, just leads to all kinds of, of problems, um, partially because of what the technology is capable or incapable of right now, um, and, and partly um, about what kind of roles we want for that technology. And... Um, so what I do find very interesting is the kinds of cultures where we can learn from that have healthier relationships to the world around them um, compared to cultures that have um, very hierarchical um, ideas about um, humans are at the top and the rest of life comes, um, comes below us on the ladder. Or even um, my type of human comes at the top and then there's the rest of the humans, and then there's the rest of the animals. Um, and so when you think about, for example, these uh, in indigenous um, uh, narratives which provide a much um, healthier way of imagining that it's perfectly possible to live and work with a kind of intelligence that's completely strange, a kind of intelligence that is unlike anything that you've seen before, and that's certainly not like a human. That is a much better way to start thinking about it, because if we ever make something intelligent out of silicon, it is not going to look like, or act like, or think like a human. <laughs> and some traditions are just much better at imagining that. 
very interesting. Now in your research um, for many years now, have you encountered any kind of change or something that sort of spurred change in uh, cultural views on AI? Let's take the example of Japan, of course, uh, that you referred to, that you said there is uh, less concern in um, uh, Japanese history with the rebellion of machines, that they're more perceived as helping hands to uh, master daily routines, to do care work for the old, for the elderly, or for the sick, uh, and so forth. Could that change? What would have to happen that those narratives sort of evolve, develop, change, turn around? Have you seen examples like this happening elsewhere? Um. I think that a big change has happened um, after AI technologies um, started to be called AI technologies again from sort of between 2012 and 2016. Mm -hmm. So, which is, um, uh, before that we had what is known as an AI winter in which very few people talked about AI, very few people said they were working on it. It was an extremely uncool topic and there was no money in it at all. Until in 2012, suddenly, um, image recognition improved massively, almost overnight by the introduction of new machine learning technologies. And so that created a new AI hype wave that was still riding the, uh, to this moment. Um, and especially as um, several major improvements and transitions in, in AI happened. But the problem was that um, sort of un until a few years ago, if you wanted to talk about this new technology that people called AI, what you had to fall back on was the most recent big AI narrative that you could remember seeing in the cinema, which was probably in the West, The Matrix or The Terminator. And so, um, I, I don't know if it, if it was the same here in Germany, but in the UK, they literally slapped Terminator pictures on everything. Um, the government put out a report on the UK's economic future with AI, bam, Terminator picture. An um, article on FinTech, Terminator picture. An article <laughs> on an invention of drones that could fly backwards, Terminator. There's a certain logic he became governor of California, right? <laughs> yes, well, he was known as the governator. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so the problem was that you had these old stories and new technologies, and they didn't match up. Um, but what we did see over the last few years particularly, and, and sometimes um, authors have been explicitly commissioned to write new stories, to create new narratives, other times, there has just been so much criticism of these old stories that people have been inspired to create new ones. And so over the last three years or so, there's been an explosion of AI narratives that are a lot more exciting uh, in terms of how they respond to contemporary technology. And sometimes you do see that people then start borrowing from other traditions. I think the, 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 the children's um, animated film Big Hero 6 is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Because although it's an American animated film, it is very strongly influenced by Japanese uh, film uh, traditions. It's actually, the, the whole aesthetic of it is uh, somewhere literally halfway San Francisco and Tokyo in a fictional city called San Francisco, in which a child builds... Um, a robot, a care robot, and the whole story is about um, uh, how uh, this robot, um, how, how he and this robot work together um, to get revenge on the baddies, but also how this robot becomes a true supportive companion and how in the future he can see these care robots really curing people. And, and so it has a very positive message. And that, I think, is a direct influence more from the Japanese side. Yeah, thank you for that uh, example. Um, in a paper uh, you cited with your co-author, Stephen Cave, um, you discussed three possible solutions to sort of, well, let's say plainly, to fix racist AI, right? To make it less white, to make it less dominantly white. Um, you say three things. Avoiding anthropomorphization, that's what we just discussed now. Two more things, explicitly critiquing racial role typing and representing powerful AI as non-white. So um, 
I would think that the latter two, uh, critiquing or critique of uh, racial stereotyping, of course, and representing powerful AI as non-white should be easy. I mean, that should be possible. That should be possible to fix, right? Do you see as much progress as you're hoping for on that front at the moment and where? There is some uh, uh, progress. Um, there are some, um, especially in TV. I find that in TV, progress comes much easier than in film, perhaps because TV can introduce a much bigger cast so that um, they can have multiple people of color in these major roles, but also have white people so that they don't get too many complaints. Uh, whereas in film, if you put in one um, person of color as the lead, then they get a lot of complaints, um, which is now the case with the Percy Jackson films and before that um, mm. with um, Harry Potter and whatnot. Um, so yes, I have seen progress happening. So some examples are um, Westworld, where the two main AI characters, um, or the three main AI characters, oh, do I, do I spoil this? It's been 2016, it's been a while. <laughs> so there is one white woman, one black woman, and one black man as the main um, AIs. Um, but also the series, um, uh, Humans, which is a, um, uh, a British uh, TV series about AI, which has uh, uh, the British Asian actress Gemma Chan in, in the lead. And so, especially in TV, that's, yeah, I'm very excited to see that happening. So when you say TV, that includes, of course, streaming services, right? Uh, like global companies like Netflix and uh, Amazon. And yes. And HBO uh, and mm -hmm. so forth. Yes, and actually, Amazon, no, Netflix has made uh, now a film called Outside the Wire, which has um, only one AI in it, and that is um, an AI played by uh, a black man, um, Anthony Mackie, uh, who you might know from The Avengers. Um, so, um, and, and I think that is the first one I've seen um, coming out of uh, the US with um, a single black AI in the lead. Are they doing it because they know so much more about data? The streaming services do, of course, that's their business model, building recommender systems that work. Yeah, so, so, so you mean they develop the film in order to respond to the demographic yeah. that wants it? I, I, I probably, I think so, yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, which, uh, which, which is a very cynical take on it, but um, at the same time, it also shows um, how, how big this demographic is and how big the ask for these kinds of films is, that you can throw lots of money at it. And it shows how, um, uh, how underserved that massive demographic is. And that demographic is, of course, not just, you know, black men who um, look exactly like the black protagonist, but anyone who might enjoy um, this, uh, by the way, r really interesting film. Also, because it happens, so it's, it's a film from 2020 or 21, and um, it's uh, set in Ukraine, where there is a very strong border tension with Russia, um, and, and it's set in, uh, well, the near future because, um, because the main character is an AI and so the Americans come to intervene in, in Ukraine. So it has become newly extra relevant. Mm -hmm. One last question before we open this up here, uh, of course, to you and uh, at home through the Slido participatory tool. The dreams of, or imaginings, as you call them often, of intelligence machines are very old, uh, as you showed us, uh, not just decades, centuries, thousands of years in some cases. Um, if you define AI the way you did it um, at the beginning of your talk. Um, so how to, how to build new machines that sort of clash in certain values or instances with very old beliefs and narratives. When they're saying, okay, respect local tradition or, uh, or regional tradition or whatever, but uh, do it with less gender stereotyping, for example. What to do there? Yeah, that's a really interesting one. And I think it's, it's just um, really important for developers of technology to bear in mind these kinds of histories and, and expectations that you will face when you try to deploy technology anywhere. 
is um, the, the idea that people have these automatic assumptions about what it will do, and that need to be addressed indeed explicitly, mm -hmm. um, uh, that need to be ad um, addressed, um, and that could be, in, uh, for example, through what do you call your technology? Um, for example, some people are walking back from the idea of calling everything artificial intelligence because it might be misleading, because people rely too much on it, thinking that it's a lot cleverer than it really is. Um, and um, uh, in, in other cases, uh, people decide to make their robots look more or less like humans, depending on um, how much people want their robots to look like humans. And again, what kind of expectations they have of, um, of robots and of human-like creatures in their house. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so, um, and I think in, in some cases this just has been um, not given enough attention to, and that's where you see these kinds of clashes um, like you got with the uh, British responses to w what do you think AI is, um, where there's this massive gap between what it really is and what people think of it or want from it or are terrified of. Yeah. Speaking of which, I think this chair here is sort of um, made by a German AI that sort of respected lesser height of Swiss people. I'm kind of drowning in this thing here, so <laughs> it's kind of hard to look around, but uh, I think there's a microphone out there somewhere, and we're taking questions from the floor. Now, please raise your hand. We only have one microphone and one guy doing sports. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's one right at the column. Uh, well, th uh, thank you for your presentation. I have one uh, question regarding uh, your rules on how to make them uh, less uh, less racial. Um, the, you, you mentioned that it would be better to make them not look human, and then you mentioned examples of movies how they were played by uh, humans that were that were black of, or at least non-white. Is there a way you could imagine of reaching both goals at the same time, or is it a necessary step to reach? Um, uh, that through a non-human way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a really good question because it's a dilemma that people who uh, uh, work on human AI and human robotics interaction really struggle with. Because on the one hand, if you, if you have a, um, a, a robot, making it look less human avoids all these problems of gender and race. But at the same time, making something look more human has all kinds of positive effects as well. Um, so, uh, f for example, trusting something more than some really clunky, grey, shiny, boxy thing. I mean, um, uh, say the machine is meant to help um, lift patients who can't walk out of bed and put them into their wheelchair you know, um, if it looks slightly more like a human or more like something friendly with arms instead of, I don't know, something that just looks like, uh, like it comes straight out of a car factory, that can really help put patients at their ease. You don't want it to look too much like a human. So this is a really big problem. And an additional problem is one um, uh, that's called mirroring, which is that actually people particularly... Um, from uh, minority backgrounds or from oppressed backgrounds are more at their ease when they feel like they're communicating with someone like themselves. Um, so, uh, for example, so there's been experiments where, um, for example, African-American people were um, put in a chat room with a chatbot that identified as um, a white man or a white woman or a black man or a black woman with, you know, just a completely art, um, um, like uh, artsy looking drawn avatar. But it helped. They felt better understood when it was presenting as someone like them. And so here you get this, uh, um, this, this problem of, yes, uh, making things le look less human it's a great goal to solve some of the problems, but sometimes you need to make things look or sound human. And then having a wider range of representations 
is, of course, much better than having this very narrow set. Same also applies to um, uh, voice-operated assistants. I mean, they, um, there's so much research that has gone into what Siri and Alexa and, and the like sound like um, in order to make, um, to, to make people feel at ease interacting with them. Just, um, and, and, and not feel concerned that, um, that, that it sounds too cold or aggressive or anything. I'm still amazed at um, how uniform those systems sound. I think you have, like, with, with Siri, with Apple, you have the choice of a female and a male voice. That's it, right? Um, or is there more? So, so originally, um, Siri and Alexa and Microsoft's Cortana all launched only with a female voice. Female voice um, only, that's right, yeah. And then there was a lot of backlash saying, no, look, that's all very nice, that research that shows that people are happier bossing female voices around, but actually isn't the reason for that a long history of people being really comfortable bossing women around rather than men. So they added male voices, and now they've actually got a huge range. They've got, um, so for example, in English, they've got um, you know, British, Australian, uh, Standard American, but also African American vernacular English. Um, and really? um, yeah, they've really, um, they've now got um, Indian English. They, they really improved their range. Um, we have that in Germany. Do we have a Bavarian Siri? <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm not joking. It might be. But but do you, do you have um, German, Austrian, and Swiss Siri, for example? Uh, no. Mm. I don't think so. <laughs> oh, in Switzerland, it would be really complicated. You'd have to have a new Siri for every five kilometers. So uh, <laughs> you don't want to do this. This would be just too messy. Uh, yeah. But let's take another question from the floor, please. Speak up. There's one in the back there. Thank you very much for a nice talk. So I, I'm curious about also about the uh, uh, difference of the generations. And uh, uh, we are also researching in the Japanese people and the uh, people's acceptance of the AI and robot is very different from the generation. So I hope, I, I'm curious about, yeah, is uh, kind of generation changes also uh, 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 same as a different country? So, so, sorry, was the question about the differences between different generations? Generation, yes, on each country. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes it, it's a great question. And I, I know that um, in, in many countries, the differences between, um, uh, uh, for example, the generations that grew up with stories like um, The Terminator and The Matrix, seeing them come out and going to the cinema and, and um, seeing these be a really big part of, of daily life have shaped expectations. And um, there is now actually a really interesting um, development where people are growing up, are starting to work as AI developers, as computer scientists, who just don't get the Terminator. Because, you know, the Terminator's from 1984, second one, 1991, bunch of them after that, the most recent one, 2019, but nobody watched that. I just completely flopped the last four ones. So it is very much the Terminator is starting to be seen as a last generation thing. And um, I, I'm, I'm quite excited because, as I said, there's a whole lot of new narratives coming out um, uh, that present um, uh, AI in a different light. Um, but also, um, th this new generation will be able to um, be exposed again to so many more narratives from around the world that are now being uh, platformed. And so, um, so, so for example, only um, 20, 30 years ago, it would have been a lot harder to, for Western audiences to consume a lot of Japanese um, media, like manga and anime, um, whereas now it's just out on Netflix. So I think that the, the crossovers are, are really, um, I, th I think, improving contemporary attitudes to AI. Although at the same time, people are growing up with a sense of, well, actually, is AI going to somehow threaten my future? Um, although I'm encouraged by the fact that that doesn't seem to be a really strong narrative in, um, in many parts of the world. And not among the youngest generation. 
It's usually um, people who have been in, uh, in, in employment for a while who might find it difficult to have their um, to, to have to change their career midway through who are most concerned about um, AI taking over jobs. And at the same time, there are some narrative spirit um, in the books that uh, have not survived, so to speak, that might be interesting, like take uh, Blade Runner, uh, do electric, no, do Android stream of electric sheep, was the book called by Philippe mm -hmm. K. Dick before it came a movie. There's this device in there that is actually nothing like an Android, I forgot what it's called, where people tap into this sort of Sisyphus uh, uh, mythology uh, and do something which is not very anthropomorphic, so to speak. It was left out in the film, but uh, um, it's still there. But let's take another question before we look at Slido. Now, I don't see everybody because I see that this is the chair again and the column. I don't have Panavision here. But let's take one from this side for a moment and then switch over, right? Let's just, I'm sorry. <laughs> And then we'll switch over and then we'll go to Slido. Yeah, thank you for your patience. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for that fascinating talk. I have a very short question, which is why no South Asian science fiction? Or maybe you mentioned it a little, because there's very interesting stuff, precisely in relation to the wonderful point you made about the relationship between cultural attachment to things. We are here in the Japanese uh, German center. So Japanese tradition of kintsukuro, iwabi-sabi, paying attention to things, not throwing away things. And also in the Indic philosophical tradition, the relationship between things with consciousness, chinmaya, chitplasmaya, and mrinmaya, things which are objects without consciousness. So you talked a lot about philosophy of science in the Chinese context, and I was wondering if you'd sort of see a connection, a continuity between this and the mind-body-object continuum. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yes, I must say, um, there have been um, many traditions that we did look at, but that I was unable to uh, include tonight. Um, I mean, we, we looked at literally every continent, mainly because when we had a workshop in Chile, we had um, representatives from indigenous groups who technically live under the Antarctic Circle, so we had all eight, seven continents taken into consideration. So on Indian um, uh, uh, philosophy and, and, and cultural thinking about AI, actually um, in our forthcoming book we have a really interesting um, chapter by um, Upamanyu uh, Mukherjee who um, writes about um, mostly the post-colonial uh, attitude of, of India uh, to AI and how, while it is strongly influenced by, um, uh, by, by British um, uh, colonialism and storytelling, much more so than by Indian philosophy, um, what they do with it is really interesting, is, is um, thinking about um, AI in, uh, in these really original ways in the mid 20th century, which, which means that these stories were um, uh, about uh, robots, about relations between um, scientific development and uh, how we should treat robots, were really present in, in, um, in, in uh, various languages in, in uh, science fiction magazines in India at the time. Um, so, which developed, not, not, not to say independently, but more as a pushback against uh, the sense of English superiority about both their own science fiction and their own science. Um, uh, basically with the attitude, but look, we can do this too, we do it completely differently. And so thank you for asking that. So we'll switch over before we go to Slido. Mm. If you could make it short, we would benefit a little bit because we're running late here. Thank you. Hi. Um, I would be really interested if you have seen any attempts or trends where um, AI is not depicted in an embodied manner in science fiction because I'm always thrilled from this link of robots or humans and AI, whether it's not existing in reality that much. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's really hard, but there are some stories where at least um, attempts are made to not make it look like 
like a robot with two arms and two legs. And, and, and all of those come from after the computer was invented. Um, it was a thing. And so you, ha you have suddenly this whole rush of um, stories about evil computers, like HAL 9000, um, or about computers that can control the world in positive ways, um, such as the, um, the, the Soviet one that I mentioned. And, um, but it's, it's really hard to write an interesting story about something that is not in any way human-like. So for example, um, Hell had to still have a voice, it still had to sound like a human because it, mm. he had to be a character in a story. And so it's mo it, it is a problem of weighing um, what a story requires with um, how abstract you can make it. Which is again uh, an another limitation that means that um, stories about AI that we already have are not always useful ways of describing what AI technology is like. Okay, one last question, please, before we <laughs> move over. I, don't, I can't see you, I'm sorry. I can. Nice presentation, thank you. My question is about AI ethics. Do you believe that each country should have uh, its own ethics, AI ethics, based on the way of understanding of AI, or there are like, a global AI ethics that should be applied globally? If so, how can we apply this? Thank, mm -hmm. you. Thank you, that's um, a really difficult question to answer and one that I think has been asked um, over and over, especially during the 20th century in different contexts. People have different philosophical traditions, different understandings of what ethics means and how do you build global systems and networks that are, uh, well, that are take into account somehow those differences. This is a problem, for example, in the context of human rights, where well, there has been a really strong attempt at making those universal, but actually, and, and uh, human rights uh, lawyers and scholars have started to point out where in some traditions they just aren't sufficient. And so that is also something that uh, the field of AI ethics is struggling with because you can't have different AI ethics in different countries. It's such a globalized technology. It's made in one place and applied in another. Um, I mean, a place like Facebook, I don't know how many have you now, of you have now given up your Facebook, but it did at some point have literally half the world on a platform. Um, so it's an ongoing question. Let's look at Slido. Where is the person? Oh, there you are. I'm sorry. I was looking in the wrong direction. No, don't worry. Um, I have one question. How is religion affecting AI narratives? You talked about the absence of AI narratives in some regions. Um, could religion be a reason for it? Uh, the interaction of religion with AI is, is really interesting. Um, so, uh, for example, did you know that Vatican City is really up to date about its AI knowledge? The v Vatican City, like the Vatican, has its own AI ethics framework. Um, the way, for example, Germany and the EU and the UK do too. Um, and, and this is uh, partly the work of the, the Franciscan order um, who uh, make sure that the Pope is, Pope is kept up to date with um, new technological developments. And AI is particularly interesting for people in thinking from religious contexts because of the ways in which, um, on the one hand, you have questions of technology and human values, but on the other hand, you have questions about what it means to be human, or what it means to create things that are um, made in the image of the human. And particularly the Abrahamic religions um, have uh, some serious questions uh, to ask about that. That said, um, it, back when we did our research on uh, the Middle East and North Africa, we found that the conversation uh, from the Islamic perspective it is, is mo was then much less developed. There have been some uh, developments uh, since, um, but it, 
what, what we did find is that it's not the case that having a certain religious perspective rules out thinking about or fantasizing about or um, wondering about AI. I mean, again, thinking from the Islamic perspective, the Thousand and One Nights are one of the story sets that have these ancient imaginings of artificial beings made of brass and copper in them. Um, and, and other religions um, do all have, have their own ways of, of uh, thinking about this. So actually, the religious perspective is a really important one as a source for different ways of thinking about other intelligences. Thank you so much. Any more from Slido? That's it. Okay, then I have one last question, maybe to wrap this up, Kanta, if you allow me. Um, when we talk about AI, we also talk, of course, about... Uh, hugely scalable amounts of data that are needed um, to, for AI to process, <laughs> uh, to produce those results, and a, a large amount of data, of course, that are produced while doing so. And not only in Europe, of course, this is a, also a huge question of data security, uh, of how this data is stored, by whom it is stored. Um, is it large companies, uh, the GAFA companies, uh, or is it actually state-owned? Is it centralized? Is it de decentralized? Now, when we listen to you and your research now in the past 90 minutes, we basically talked about uh, a diversity of how we should perceive, even in the West, how A is seen across the world, right? Which is sort of a movement of thought um, that would tend to decentralization, right? Um, how we see AI has been too dominant, too hegemonic uh, in the West, to put it plainly. Now, how, what's your take now on the storage? Of course, we, there's, a, there's those, you know, tech wars, we might call it, between the East and the West and Europe, how to store this data uh, and what to do with it. What's your take on that? Should we do the same thing with the idea of storing uh, all this data uh, that you proposed actually in seeing AI? Mm. So my take on, on decentralizing data storage. I think, I mean, on, on data there are... Um, I guess, I guess two different perspectives. And the one perspective is more data makes more AI. And if the data set is currently biased, that just means that not enough people across the world have been added to the data set. Mm. If the data set is biased in favor of white people, that means that you just need to add more data of non-white people to the data set. The other take is, um, well, that's, that's all well and good, but what are you going to use that data for? And actually, I'm quite all right with not being facially recognized because the data was never trained on people like me. Um, I, 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 I'm happy with that, and especially um, people who are from groups that are systematically over-surveilled already, systematically mm. over-policed already, mm. might not want to be included in that data set. Mm. Now, I, I think um, that there are um, uh, similar, um, I guess, um, uh, approaches and ways of thinking about um, how, how to imagine a future with intelligent machines. On the one hand, diversifying the, the kinds of stories that we have here to make sure that the stories that come out of, um, for example, California and Silicon Valley aren't biased, but also some stories are just people's own and don't make sense in different contexts. And it's great to be aware of them, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we can um, take them out, uh, out of their uh, specific context. I think the same goes for, for data, that in some cases, improving the data set diversifying is great. In some cases, um, keeping the data set small and local is also, uh, is also great. It depends on what it's going to be used for. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So tomorrow it's down to Dahlem, to the Japanese German center uh, in a different part of town that we've been today here, right at the Spree in uh, Berlin Mitte, I think it is already here. Um, thanks for this beautiful kickoff. Kanta Dihal being with us from England for making the journey and of course to you all people actually 
coming into this live space. I enjoyed that very much. So have a good conference. Have a good evening. Thank you. Kantari Hall. Thank you.